However, for our first hour, I am very pleased to welcome in studio for the entire hour, Bill Barr, the former attorney general of the United States. He served, of course, under President Trump, and he's out with a new book called One Damn Thing After Another, Memoirs of an Attorney General. And it's big. It is a thick book. If you're watching on the live stream at foxnation.com, you can see this is not something that is quickly written. It is not something that's quickly read. But I read the whole thing because I admire the attorney general. We have gotten to know each other just a little bit in recent years. And as I said on Special Report recently, after Brett Bayer got a crack at (laughs) the attorney general in that interview, Brett asked for our reaction. I said it's one of the few memoirs, political memoirs, that I've really looked forward to in a while in this town, and it did not disappoint. Before I get to the Attorney General, just to put my cards on the table, something that we have lamented on this show for years now is a problem that we have in our politics that this is not an original thought on my part, but the term is an unreliable narrator problem where you have people in power who are not reliable narrators, fill in the blank who that might be, presidents current and past. You also have the news media, whose job it is to be a reliable narrator, and in many, many cases, they, or even we, are not. For what it's worth, in my opinion, Bill Barr is a reliable narrator, which is why I think this book is important. And I will get into what I mean by that here in the question and answer back and forth, but he's a serious person. I will admit, though, I did laugh out loud a few times reading the book, including (laughs) yesterday on the flight. People were looking at me. There are some really great anecdotes in there. Mr. Attorney General, it is great to see you. Welcome in. Thank you, Guy. It's great to be here. I want to start, as silly as it might sound, with the title, One Damn Thing After Another. It is a perfect title. It's fitting for you and your personality. It's fitting for the moment and the era in which you served, but it comes from an attorney general of many years past. Briefly explain that story, if you would. Yes. So when Ronald Reagan asked William French Smith to be his attorney general, Smith went to his uh, the, the last Republican attorney general that preceded him, Ed Levy, who was a uh, professor at the law school in Chicago and eventually head of the University of Chicago. So he was an academic and he used to wear bow ties and puff a pipe, very much the part. And William French Smith said, uh, so tell me about the position of attorney general. And he was expecting to get a long lecture about the rule of law and the unique role of the attorney general. And Levy puffed on his pipe took it out of his mouth and said, it's one damn thing after another. (laughs) And from then on, attorneys general have always said to each other, that's what the job is, one damn thing after another. I I have a feeling that mine was probably more that way than (laughs) than most. That was my thought, right? (laughs) Uh, Levy died years ago, but I wonder, you could go back and tell him, sir, you have no idea. (laughs) Because reading this book, it's pretty extraordinary. When I am... Really enjoying a hard copy book I and preparing for an interview, I will make notes in the mm-hmm, margin. Mm-hmm. That, and occasionally I will just draw an exclamation point on a page where mm-hmm. I have that kind of a moment. The first exclamation point I wrote in the margin of your book was when you tell the story of how your wife found out that you were going to be Attorney General of the United States. We're skipping way ahead here, your childhood, right. your right. education, some very important roles in the Justice Department. Mm-hmm. But under President George H.W. Bush, you're going to become Attorney General. Big deal. You're a young guy for that huge position. Yeah. She didn't know until? Until it was announced on the radio after I had been announced in the Rose Garden. Uh, I was 41. I had been the deputy for uh, Dick Thornburg, a former governor of uh, Pennsylvania, and he went to run for the Senate, and uh, the president called me into the Oval Office and said, uh, I'm going to make you attorney general and um, see if you can reach your wife, but I'd like to do it in the next half hour out in the Rose Garden because we were having a ceremony out there. And I, those were not the days we had cell phones, so... Uh, she heard about it on well, the car radio. In the car radio, like I feel like you got to keep your hands at ten and two at that point. Right. Stay on the road when you hear that. It's like, and you can't even rewind it, right? It's like, right. did I just hear that correctly? That's, right. That's how your wife found out this huge career move had occurred for you. Yes. Now the Bush era, because you were Attorney General during Bush forty one. Yes. And there are some amazing stories in this book that we mm-hmm. we don't have time to get into, right. but bringing Noriega to justice. Mm-hmm. 
a guarantee that you made to a president of the United States, which is kind of a, a ballsy thing, but uh, <laughs> you followed through on that guarantee. Uh, the hostage situation at a prison involving foreign nationals who were right. being housed there and the resolution to sort of like Hollywood level yeah. rescue story. Yeah. Uh, the colossal mistake that you call a Supreme Court nomination by President Bush. There's there's a lot of major history in there. But I want to focus at least for the remainder of this segment on really the heart and soul of the job that you had, which was prosecuting crime. This is a very hot issue once again in the United States. Right. Crime is on the rise. It was a real scourge at that time. Yes. You helped implement certain policies that you write literally reduced criminals, including hardened gang members, to tears. That's right. Talk about what you did in the 90s and then what you guys tried to do under the Trump administration as well with Relentless Pursuit and Operation Legend. Right. And where we are now, because Americans are on edge, I think, for good reason. Right. Well, uh, crime peaked in the United States in 91, 92, when I was attorney general, my last year as attorney general under Bush. And it had been going up. Uh, it had almost quintupled since 1960. It had just soared. And at that time, all the states had these revolving door systems of justice. The incarceration rates were actually going down as crime skyrocketed. And uh, up until that time, the federal government had a very limited role to play in violent crime. But what I suggested uh, to first to Dick Thornburg and eventually to the president was that we lean forward and we use our tough federal laws, our gun laws, our gang laws, our RICO statutes, uh, and our drug laws for narcotics operations to go after the main violent people uh, in communities and to work with the locals on identifying them and then putting them in the federal system where they'd really get some stiff time. The story you're referring to happened with an anti-gang task force in Philadelphia. The uh, Philadelphia had, again, a revolving door system, and the, when the when the kids were arrested or the, the gang members were arrested, they'd be out on the street the next day. People wouldn't provide information. They were terrorized by them. And uh, we went in there with this program and we swept up hundreds of gang members and one operation in particular, they were being marched through the neighborhood back to where the uh, they would be taken in, in the vans. And they were laughing and smug and because they thought this was going to be business as usual, they'd be back out there. And then when they saw that they were being taken federally in, in federal wagons, uh, one of them started crying and banging his head against the van. And I said, you know, we have a federal criminal justice system that reduces these criminals to tears. We need 50 of those systems in this country. Every state, their system should be just as tough as the federal system. And so what we did was – we leaned forward and we, and we used our federal laws to incapacitate the most violent working with the locals, but we also pushed the states to reform their system. And for 22 years from that point forward, if you look at a chart of crime in the U.S., it hit a stone wall in 1992, and it went down for 22 consecutive years. It was cut in half, and it only started going up again under Obama when people started going back to the revolving door system of justice and demonized the police. Uh, and that, of course, really got worse toward the tail end of your second stint under Trump because of right. the George Floyd riots and all of that. And as I was reading about these initiatives, both Trump era and Bush era, one of the concerns I had, and, and you addressed it a bit in the Trump era, of course, was a key element is working with the locals, as you right. call them, mm -hmm. at the federal level. Is that borderline impossible if you have the top prosecutors at the local level who are committed to being in some ways pro-criminal, which is what we're seeing right now? Right. So, you know, when COVID hit, crime, even before COVID, crime had started going back up. Uh, around, uh, in the cities, in some big cities, because of these social justice DAs and the weakening of the state criminal justice system. We went into a number under uh, Operation Legend, uh, named after a little kid who was killed while he was sleeping in Kansas City. We went into uh, eight uh, cities 
uh, to work with the state and local to try to push crime down. Some of those cities had good prosecutors, and that was one of the reasons we were there. But we did go into some cities that were broken, like Chicago. The president wanted us to go into Chicago. And I told him the local the, the, the police were good, and the chief of police I liked there, but uh, a guy named Brown who had come up from Dallas. But uh, the prosecutors were not really prosecuting the crimes. But we did our best uh, to help them out. Bill Barr is my guest, former attorney general of the United States. His new book is One Damn Thing After Another. Let's get to Russiagate and the Trump era in earnest when we return. We have him for the full hour here live in studio. It's the Guy Benson Show. We will be right back. I'm Guy Benson on The Guy Benson Show. With me in studio live is former U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr. His new book is One Damn Thing After Another. And you are, throughout this book, extremely critical of the news media. Right. And you give some examples from your time <clears throat> under Bush 41 and then, of course, under Trump. And I wonder if you can pinpoint for us what you think the most unfair thing you can recall the media doing to both of your bosses at the presidential level, Bush and then Trump? Well, Bush, uh, they, they brought Bush down. Uh, Bush, Bush, after the Gulf War in March of um, 1991, was at 89 percent approval rating. And through a combination of a big lie, sort of like Russiagate, the idea was that he had secretly armed Iraq and therefore it doesn't deserve any credit for that victory. That was completely bogus, total lie, uh, and was proven to be uh, eventually. Uh, then they also presented him as out of touch, that he, didn't, that he had never seen a scanner in a supermarket. Again, a total lie. The video shows that he well understood what a scanner was and he was remarking at the specific technology. Right, the, new technology. A new technology. And then uh, – the third uh, was uh, the idea that we were in the deepest and darkest recession, even though that was 19 months of consecutive month-by-month uh, -month economic growth. And, and um, in November, after the election, the press went from 90 to 90-10 on bad news on the economy and immediately turned around. Uh, so it was oh, good their, news. Their yeah. guy, Bill Clinton, by that point, yeah, was elected and, president. Right. And even though he wasn't president, he started getting the credit for the turnaround. So, I mean, that was uh, – I don't remember that stuff. Yeah. I was very young, and that was bad. But you write in the book, it has only gotten worse. Yes. And that brings us to the present day. What was the most unfair thing you saw? Well, it was obvious – well, it was Russiagate. I mean, Russiagate was a, was a monstrous big lie, uh, and it's had a lot of uh, – other. It, it hobbled the administration. It deprived a duly elected president of being able to – uh, run a uh, an, you know his his uh, branch of government and execute on the policies he had promised to deliver, and uh, kept them kept them on the defensive for over two years. But it had other ramifications. It fundamentally prevented the United States from uh, a normal foreign policy engagement with Russia, uh, and. Uh, you know, trying to find some kind of modus vivendi with Russia. I mean, maybe it would have been possible to avoid the current circumstance. I don't know. But President Trump was unable to follow normal diplomacy with Russia because of it. We will get to more on Russiagate in the next segment. Quickly here, you had no intention of going back into government. Your right. wife half-jokingly said she would divorce you if you did. Right. But then you did. I did. Because you felt an obligation. You talked about the process of how that happened and bringing mm -hmm. your family on board. During the confirmation process, you mentioned two U.S. senators who refused to even meet with you, almost acknowledge your existence during your confirmation process. You'd been unanimously confirmed previous time in the 90s. One of those two senators is now vice president, That's Kamala right. Harris. Just right. your reflection on that, that she wouldn't even meet with you at the time as a senator, what does that say in your mind? What did it tell you about her? Well, that, that she's hyper-partisan uh, and, and, and is not a fair-minded person. There were Democratic senators at the time who voted against you, but were secretly, at least, you know, behind closed doors in Washington, 
happy yes. that you were the nominee. Yes. Is is that a weird thing to, <laughs> to have people privately telling you, we're glad it's you, but we're voting no? It's a little weird, but it shows the malady uh, at work these days, which is a lack of courage. Uh, and the fact that – and this is true in both parties to some extent. You know, politicians who want to hold their job, they're worried about getting challenged from their – from uh, in the Democrats' case from the left flank and the Republican from the right flank. So they spend all their time worried about people who are more extreme than them are. They are challenging them and taking extreme <laughs> – you know, not wanting to offend the extremists in the party. And it's come a long way. I guess it's devolved quickly in our politics. You got 100 Senate votes in the 90s, three Democrats – this time right, out. Right. I was unanimously confirmed for three different positions under President Bush. And then not so much under Trump. And then <laughs> the fun began. And we will talk about Russiagate. We'll yeah. talk about the election controversies, your sparring with the president, and other non-Trump related things as well with Bill Barr, former U.S. Attorney General, on The Guy Benson Show, talking about his new book, One Damn Thing After Another. Back here live on The Guy Benson Show. Our guest is Bill Barr, former United States Attorney General under President Trump. His book, and President George H.W. Bush, I'll add, his book is One Damn Thing After Another. Let's talk about the Trump administration, Mr. Attorney General, and Russiagate in particular. You said it was the most unfair thing done to Trump, perpetrated by many people, but including the media, very much involved, very invested in that. Mm -hmm. One thing that strikes me, reading the book, and just before the book, just following your second stint as attorney general was a lot of the decisions that you made on important, significant, let's say politically sensitive matters felt kind of like a lose-lose for you. Because if you did something that President Trump wasn't going to like, he would let the whole world know about it. And you had an irate president sometimes picking up the phone and screaming at you or bringing you into the office and yelling at you. And you would get basically no credit for it, bank no credit with your critics in the media and the Democrats. Then if you made decisions on other matters that Trump was happy about, it was like a constitutional crisis, right? People running around with their hair on fire saying that you're just a lackey doing Trump's bidding. And this was a familiar phenomenon over and over again. One element that really frustrated Trump was decisions that you made, prudential decisions as attorney general, not to prosecute or charge certain people, like Jim Comey, for example. You say that was not a close call, in your opinion. Andrew McCabe, his deputy, did lie under penalty of perjury on multiple occasions. I know many conservatives that I speak to were frustrated that he didn't really face consequences. Why was McCabe not charged? Well, I can't get in, you know, to those to those uh, specific reasons, but uh, you know, the, there were there were good reasons why we were not able to proceed with that case. Um, I, you know, a, a well-known politician came to me after I was attorney general the first time under Bush and said that he was thinking of going in to be attorney general under W. And what did I think? And I said, you, you still have political ambitions. You'd be crazy to do it because as attorney general, you only spend political capital. You don't make it. If you go in trying to win approval from people, you will fail. You have to be willing to make the decision knowing that people are going to be unhappy. And furthermore, of not being able to explain your decision publicly because these proceedings are usually confidential and protected by law. So uh, you, 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 by definition, have to take a lot of guff. And the president didn't like some of the calls. I, and now with Comey, it had to do with his four memos and whether he had willingly disclosed classified information. Uh, and I had to uh, make these calls based on the recommendation uh, of the prosecutors and the evidence that we had and what the standards are. There's standards of when the department brings an indictment. We have to feel we have proof beyond a reasonable doubt to establish the – And you didn't. We didn't. And you didn't. It was so. that simple. And uh, I wasn't going to bend the rules just because someone was the enemy of the president. Uh, but by the same token – cases were brought to me. I don't control what cases percolate up to me. Uh, and frequently, you know, the, the difficult decisions are brought to me <clears throat> and are brought to the top. And uh, you had these two line – or some line prosecutors, two of whom worked for, for Mueller who wanted to uh, 
impose like a seven to nine year penalty on Roger Stone. Right. You talk about that whole right. experience yeah. as well. And you said that's also not fair. Right. And you were ripped apart on the left for that decision. Right. And you explain how you reached that conclusion right. as well in the book. And in, the judge, you know. Agreed with yeah, you. Yeah, right. Uh, so. You were just sitting prior to our interview in our green room here yeah. at the Fox News Bureau, and it is named after our late great colleague, Charles Krauthammer, yes. who coined the term Bush derangement syndrome. <laughs> there was a lot of Trump derangement syndrome out there, for sure, still is. Yes. I came around to the view that there was also Barr derangement syndrome. And I came to that conclusion when you put out your memo summarizing the top line conclusions of the Mueller report. And people absolutely lost their minds. Right. And then we read the report, what, a few weeks later, and it was absolutely accurate. Yes. And to this day, it is an article of faith in the mainstream media and on the left that you misled the country, if not outright lied about what Mueller said. I, I don't understand how sentient, literate people can believe that. I know that Mueller kind of put out that weird letters right. feeding into that. Yes. My theory of the case, and I'd like your reaction, is these people were so invested on Trump being guilty that the facts made them very upset and very angry that they didn't lead to the conclusion, to the outcome that they were rooting for. And so they just pounded the table and you were the scapegoat. I, I can't think of any logical reason why that moment resulted in this torrent of criticism about something that was accurate. I mean, I'm, right. to this day, I don't it, get it. it. It is a mystery, but I agree. Uh, they wanted, they thought that Russiagate was going to knock Trump out of office, and they thought that uh, Mueller was going to be the instrument of that. And they were very angry that there was a no collusion finding and also that he punted on the issue of obstruction. And they f had a tantrum. And as you know, I had asked Mueller to give me the report so I could put it out quickly. He didn't. And which meant there was going to be weeks delay of, of redaction. He agreed to it. He agreed to yes. it and then didn't do it. He didn't do it. So when I got the report, we're talking about a two or three week period. Where, I, where, where we couldn't put out the report. The feeding frenzy. And, and in fact, that Friday, people were saying, oh, uh, if, unless the Justice Department puts it right out, it must mean that he's a criminal and the, you know, he's going, to jail. going to jail and so forth. And the stock market would be affected. Our foreign policy would be affected. So I had to at least give the bottom line. And as you say, no one was, no one was misled. I accurately said that he did not exonerate uh, the president. You even included that yeah, I, I inclu weird line that, of theirs. Right. And I included that weird line. Uh, and then, and I, in my book, I go over the headlines of the next day, which were clearly not misled. They said, you know, uh, there was no collusion, but the story is more complicated on obstruction. Barr says he's not exonerated and so forth. So, you know, I, it, it was a tantrum. It was a tantrum. Are you surprised that John Durham's investigation is still going? No, not really, because uh, see, people have to understand that he didn't get the, the IG's report on Crossfire Hurricane until December of 2019. Uh, and uh, so he, he came in in, in uh, really got going April, May time frame, but was focused on sort of little bunny trails that we had to clean up while we waited for the IG's report to be finished. So at the end of 2019, he gets the IG's report, which is all about the Inspector FBI, General. The Inspector General, all about the FBI and, and, and the spying and so forth. And he gets to work on that. And then three months later, we have COVID. The grand juries across the country are shut down. So that delayed a lot of things. Plus, he's looking in the term that you've used in interviews is his job, Durham, his task with the full waterfront of how we got to this whole Russia right. insanity to begin with. So there's a lot to chase down. You have been insistent, as you were just there, that the Trump campaign was spied upon. Right. It seems like more evidence has emerged of that recently. Yep. Just to give a sense of why the, the book title is so apropos, one damn thing after another, you write <laughs> that on July 24th, Mueller testifies before Congress, 2019. He did not 
do well, in my view. It was clear it landed with a thud. This thing's over. Right. You guys clink glasses at the <laughs> DOJ that night. Finally, we're freaking done with this stuff. The next day was the Zelensky phone call. That's right. And off to the races on the first impeachment. <laughs> Wild. Not not the second impeachment, which I, which I want to get to here. Right. 2020 election, you insist and you make the case that Trump beat himself. Um, and you talk about how you tried to intercede with the president from time to time and say, hey, you know, you really ought to consider this. Often it fell on deaf ears. You walked out of a gathering watching the first presidential debate. You were so frustrated and disgusted by the way that was going. Ultimately, what happened happened. Trump lost the election. A lot of people have asked you, because your relationship with the president became frayed toward the end. Yes. Famously. Um, you've come on a lot of different shows, TV, radio, et cetera. People ask you all about January 6th, President Trump. 2024, you've talked about, you know, what you might consider doing in 2024. I guess the question that I have for you, and I'm just going to this portion of the book. So let's see, page 548, you talk about the president not appreciating the reality of the situation of the election. Mm -hmm. Page 551, you talk about, I'll just quote, after the election, he, Trump, was beyond restraint. He would only listen to a few sycophants who told him what he wanted to hear, reasoning with him was hopeless. Uh, skipping ahead just a couple of pages, 557, you say that the treatment of the president, of the then vice president, Mike Pence, was despicable. It's a very strong word. And you even put out a statement just after January 6th saying that this was a betrayal of his office, his office, Trump's office. And yet, you have said that if he were the nominee for the party again in 2024, you would support him because of all the problems that you have with the left. And I think you and I agree on almost every point about how this administration is a disaster. But there is sort of a, a fitness for office question. And some of the stuff that you write, really tough stuff about the way that he behaved in his psychology – People have wondered, how is that not disqualifying in your mind, having been on the inside? How would you answer that question? Why is that stuff in your mind not disqualifying? Well, he, he as I've said, his, his, some of his traits that are bad, like his impulsiveness, also had a good side to them. And it, it added to the decisiveness and the, and the dynamism of the administration. And as long as there were people around cabinet secretaries and White House staff who could you know, prevent him from you know, taking things too far or, or going off in some cockamamie direction, things were pretty much on track. And up until the election, I was fairly satisfied with the record. I thought it was a successful administration. In well, that. even when you resigned in your letter, yes. you listed accomplishments, and he told you, this is the best list of accomplishments that I've seen right. summarized. And yeah. you were like, under your breath, maybe we should have run on this and not all this other craziness. Oh, right. Uh, and uh, I, I think that he was shocked by, he, he, he persuaded himself that he was going to win at the end because of the size of the crowds. I don't know what was going on in his mind, but you know there were people who were very forcefully uh, presenting the idea that he had uh, that you know there had been fraud. And I think that he made a, a shameful mistake, which is to encourage this mob to go up to Capitol Hill in order – with this crazy idea that it could be turned around somehow. Well, he January. believed that he had won. At least for a while, you said he believed that he was going to serve another term. That's, that what he, he, that's how he appeared to me. I mean I, that yeah, seems yeah. like a, a disconnect from the reality though. Well, yeah. I don't know what was going on, You know whether, whether – uh, you know, he really believed it or not. I really can't say. But uh, there were a lot of people telling him that and that it was stolen. And, and uh, you know, he persuaded himself that there was some opportunity to try to turn that around. I – if – if and, and as I said, I will support somebody else for the nomination and, and do what I can because I think it's a great opportunity for the Republican Party to really have a transforming election. But if he's the nominee, I, it, it's hard for me to conceive that I would not vote for the Republican nominee uh, if it meant – if the alternative was a, was a Democrat that was under the control of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, and I think uh, I'd weigh all the, 
relative risks, and it would be uh, a choice between two very unsatisfactory options. Uh, but I would, in the case of uh, Trump uh, in another term, I would have to count ultimately on the people who are around him in the cabinet uh, and on the staff to uh, make sure that he stays on track. No round three for you? No way. At Main Justice? <laughs> no way. One of the people that comes up in the book a number of times, another cabinet secretary under President Trump that you seem to have a great amount of respect and affection for is someone that I know a little bit as well, Secretary Pompeo. Yes. There's no real secret that he is thinking about running for president. Um, he has not ruled out even challenging President Trump in a primary potentially. Is he someone that you could envision supporting in a Republican primary for president? Yes, I've had a long associate, not a long, but I mean, I've... Uh, when he was director of the CIA, I was on his external advisory board, and then he was a colleague in the cabinet. And I have tremendous respect for him, and given the dangers around the world, you know, he'd be a very formidable candidate for president, and and someone who I think would make a great president. And I think that's one of the things that I'm uh, concerned about with Trump is that uh, we have a great uh, stable of excellent people that could be president. Uh, Pompeo is one, but there are others too, senators and governors and so forth, and it's time to give one of them a chance. Very quickly before this break, there's so much drama, there's so much rancor, there is also a lot of success in the Trump administration. On balance, looking back, you didn't want the job. You finally decided that you would accept the job. Are you glad that you did? I, I wouldn't say I, I, I was glad that I did. It, it's always an honor to serve the country, and I'm glad in that respect. Uh, Do you regret taking the job? No, I don't regret taking the job. Uh, I, I was very disappointed because I think the president, because uh, uh, of his inability to control himself, uh, uh, blew the election. He could have won that election, and he didn't, and a lot was riding on it. Uh, but I also, when I look back, we accomplished a lot. And I had the opportunity of uh, working with some fantastic people at the department and in the administration. And I don't regret that experience. Bill Barr, my guest here in studio, One Damn Thing After Another is the book. It's a bestseller. And we will wrap things up. One more segment with the Attorney General when we come back on The Guy Benson Show. It's The Guy Benson Show, One Damn Thing After Another, the new book by... Two-time U.S. Attorney General Bill Barr, who joins me in studio. He's been here the whole hour. We only have a few minutes left, so quickly to conclude, your family must be delighted and relieved that this is all over. What is your uh, happiest indulgence now that you're out of public life and all this craziness, or at least out of office, where you can go back to something that you really enjoy and relax doing? Well, I'm going to brush up on my bagpiping. You know, that's something I've done since I was eight. That was years going to be old. my last question. I had a bab <laughs> I had a bagpipe question. Right. I swear, it's written down right here. Yeah. So go on. Yeah. So since I was eight, I've played, and and I'm going to uh, get back into it. And uh, now that I have the leisure time to do that, uh, and I go hunting. Uh, two of my daughters like shooting with me. So uh, you have in the middle of the book. A lot of photographs, right, with yeah. you and various uh, you know, important people, and I was hoping that because you have a, a do you have a piping yes. photo of yourself bagpiping at thirteen years back old back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I almost got the sense, given the number of times you mentioned bagpiping in this book, that if you had your druthers, you bagpiping would have been on the cover of this book. That seems like that's it, true. That's how, true. Quickly, how'd you get into that? I just love the sound, and that's one of the interesting things about it. I, uh, my father bought a record, and I heard it, and I just, I, I was like, you know, I mesmer. Want to, I, want I, to I do need that. to do that. I need to do that, and I've loved it ever since. So. Well, maybe we can do a live performance <laughs> on the air one of these days. <laughs> okay. Bill Barr was the attorney general under two presidents here in the United States of America. Most recently, of course, President Trump. His new best-selling book, One Damn Thing After Another. Mr. Attorney General, great to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much.